Good morning and happy Easter to you. So good to see you here. I know we'll continue to have people uh, coming in as the morning progresses, um, but happy Easter. Uh, I hope that today uh, as, you, as you're here and as you take this time out of your busy schedule to stop and contemplate and consider the beauty and the worth of Jesus Christ, I hope that in your heart you will be yourself a worshiper because Jesus is worthy of our worship. We don't believe in, in, in uh, Jesus' resurrection just culturally. This isn't just a, a holiday for us. We believe that he is alive. We believe in a literal Savior, Jesus Christ, who came and died for us. He died for you on the cross, and then he rose from the grave, and he lives now at the right hand of the Father, and he's praying and interceding on our behalf. And so today, I just hope as each of us leaves this place that Jesus finds us worshiping and loving him. Uh, so if you're our guest, that's our hope, that you will, you will know and, and believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. And so to that end, let's stand together, and let's begin our day by singing uh, Matthew 28, the account of the resurrection. He is not here. He has risen, as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. And so this morning, let's come and see. Let's worship him together. See the tomb where he lay. See the stone rolled away. He is risen, he is risen, he's alive. We believe that. See his hands, see his feet, touch his scars and believe. He is risen, he is risen, he's alive. Yes, he is.
God. Let's praise him together. Amen. Happy Resurrection Sunday and welcome to Easter at Richland Creek. So thankful you chose to join us today. Praise the Lord on this wonderful Sunday, absolutely. Now I'm going to ask you to do something here. As we start to fill this room up, if there are empty seats in the middle of your row, could you slide in? There'll be more folks coming in uh, throughout this service here today. But if as you are seated, just slide towards the middle, if you will. So go ahead and take a seat here for a moment. And if you have a few empty seats there, you can slide in and create. That would be wonderful as we continue to fill this up for uh, this hour. As you sit down, you'll notice in your seat there, we do have these Connect cards. Uh, you'll see there's a pin there with it as well. And so one of the things we want to do, we want you to do today is with, with COVID and all that's gone on, it has been a unique time to stay connected with individuals as a church to make sure we 
have your uh, information correct, and maybe it's your first time here as well. And so we'd ask you to do, if you've been here, if it's your first Sunday, or maybe you've been here for 15 years, uh, we'd ask you to fill out one of these cards today to make sure we have u updated information. So if you'll go ahead and start filling that out right now as I talk, it, it's okay, you won't offend me if you're continuing to fill that out as I talk. You can also find a digital version of that inside of your worship guide today. This is a worship guide, hopefully you picked one up on your way in, you'll even find to space for notes there in the back, uh, but this is our uh, worship guide for the morning, and uh, we'd ask for you to fill those out. In a few moments, we'll pass the offering plate around, and you'll have a chance to drop those in there uh, in our worship service today. But we're so thankful you chose to join uh, us for Easter at Richland Creek today. And so what I'd like to do is open us in a word of prayer before we continue to worship the one who is worthy. So let's go to the Lord in prayer today. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. Uh, for this wonderful day that we can celebrate the risen Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, today we gather to bring you glory, to, to worship you and to worship you as people who are found alive in Christ today. For we pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Would you stand and continue to sing with us today and worship the Lord Jesus, the one who is worthy of our praise.
applauding, we believe there's one member in the audience today, that is Jesus Christ. Only Jesus is worthy. We'll be looking at Revelation 5. There will be a moment, there comes a moment in our future when we'll stand in heaven and no one will be found worthy and then Jesus will step forward and he'll receive that song, worthy, worthy, over and over for all eternity. Can't wait for that day to come. What a joy that will be in our hearts to see him lifted up and magnified. Uh, so again, uh, if you're our guest, just want to sort of give you some context for what we're about to do. Usually every week we receive an offering as part of our response uh, to the message. God speaks to us and we give. Uh, we give our hearts. Sometimes as a plate passes, we give our offering. Uh, this is not a fundraiser. This is simply an act of worship to the Lord. Jesus bragged on the widow who gave the smallest amount of money. And so we're not giving to Richland Creek. We're giving to Jesus. If you're our guest, we don't want you to feel at all obligated to give, to put money in the plate as it passes. That's not our intent. Uh, this is simply an act for our members uh, to, to demonstrate worship and obedience to Jesus Christ. As that plate passes, as we sing the song. If you filled out that card, we'd love for you to put it in there. Uh, if you don't get a chance to do that at the end of the service, you can give that to one of our ushers on the way out. But as we continue to sing, we're going to sing an age-old song, Because He Lives, We Can Face Tomorrow. We have hope because of Jesus Christ. And so let this truth settle over your heart. Let Him be your peace and your hope in life.
thank you. We love you. Jesus, we thank you that you would come and die for us to pay the penalty for our sin. And then you would rise again and defeat sin and death forever and ever. Jesus, we cannot thank you enough. We cannot give enough to you. But Lord, you love us anyway. So Jesus, to take our hearts today, I pray that um, through Pastor Mike's message, our hearts would be open to hear from you. Um, and just help us remember that because you lived and because you died for us, we can have life eternal with you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning and welcome to Easter at Richland Creek today. I want to ask you today, he is risen. He is risen. Okay. He is risen. He is risen. Amen. It's so good to see all you here today. If you are a guest, we're so thankful uh, you've made this a priority to be at worship with us today and that you feel welcome today at the creek. And so uh, I'd like to ask you, if you have your copy of God's Word with you, would you turn to Revelation chapter Five, Revelation chapter 5. Now, maybe you didn't bring a Bible today. Uh, we will be looking at it. I'll be reading from it, talking about it. So if you'd like to interact with it, most of you have a smartphone that you can pull up the internet and go right to. And here's what I want, I want you to do. Type in Revelation 5, and the version of the Bible that I'll preach out of is the English Standard Version. So you type in Revelation 5 ESV, and you can follow along with me today, even on your phone as well, as we're going to be reading from the Word of God in Revelation 5 today. Now, um, just want to remind you, the next few weeks, we've been in a series as a church studying the book of Genesis, going back to the origins of how God made us, how we're designed. And then next, the next few weeks, next three weeks, we're going to spend looking at the family. And these, are, these will be children, fathers, mothers, all the different parts of the family. And in our world today, there's much being said about what makes up a family, but we need to stop and stop listening to everybody in our world and our culture and what does the Bible actually say about the family. And so we want to spend these next few weeks looking at what the Bible says about the family. So I hope you'll join us as a church as we enter into that series. Now, we're going to be reading from Revelation 5 today. And uh, one of the things we do here at the Creek, when we read from the Bible, we want to mark these moments out because we believe that this book is God's word to us. So when we're, we're hearing it, when we're reading it, we're actually hearing God speak. And so when we do that, we want to mark this moment as we read it as a moment to hear what God has to say to us. And what a wonderful passage here. It's a dramatic one in Revelation 5 for us to read. So the way we mark that out is we stand. So if you would, would you please stand in honor of the reading of the Word of God? It's our way of marking these moments to hear the Word of God. And as we do that, I want you to picture this scene. And as we're in Revelation, you think we're talking about the resurrected Lord Jesus today. We're looking to the results. What what happens? Now that Jesus is risen from the dead, what does that mean for us today? And we'll see the impact that, of that right here in Revelation 5, beginning in verse 1. The Word of God says, Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll, written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals, I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and to break its seals? No one was in heaven on earth or under the earth was, was able to open the scroll or to look into it. So I, 
I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. One of the elders said to me, weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. Between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He went and he took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the scroll, to open its seals, for you were slain and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom of pre- kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Let's go to the Lord in prayer today. Heavenly Father, on this Easter Sunday, we gather to put our attention and our affections on the Lord Jesus. And may you just for a moment give us a glimpse of what worship is like around the throne of the resurrected Lord. Lord, we need that today. We're a people that that are struggling in our world, and we need to see Jesus. So we pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. Several years ago, it was one day my wife wasn't feeling very well. She called me at work, said she was feeling lightheaded. So I came home from work, came to the house and was checking on her and she, uh, she said she continued to feel more and more lightheaded. So we, we got concerned and so we decided we were going to, to take her to the hospital to, to get her checked out. Now before I jump to tell the next part of the story, I want to tell you the ending. She was fine, everything worked out okay. And so this story is one of those that you don't laugh on the day of, but you can laugh a little bit looking back at it. So she's not feeling well, a little bit lightheaded. She's at the house, she comes downstairs, she's on her way to the car, said, babe, let's get to the car. And she gets about halfway down to the car, she sits down in a chair and she looks at me and she says, I don't don't think I can make it to the car. I think I'm gonna pass out. And then, uh, one of these moments as a husband that I'm not terribly proud of, I decided, I decided to come up with some great advice. I said, hey, we should probably go for it. <laughs> like, like, you can get up, let's, let's make it happen. Just, no, 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 I, I'm going to pass out. <laughs> we'll be fine, right? So my wife stands up, she takes a step, passes out, just like she told me she would. I reach out, I grab her, right? Now, once you learn in the, this moment, just tell a bit about Candy, she, she's a nurse. And I, now I'm a doctor, but I'm not that kind of doctor. I, if she has questions about the Trinity, I can be helpful, but in this moment, I'm not so helpful. So I'm holding my wife there, and I'll never forget the moment, so I'm standing there, and I, I, I promise you, honest, honest before the Lord, I said to her, I said, babe, I need you to wake up so that you can tell me what to do right now (laughs) with you. (laughs) Now, she eventually came to and everything worked out okay, but, but I had a moment where I thought I need someone to come and fix the broken problem that I don't feel like I can fix. And we step into Revelation chapter 5 here, and there's a scene at the throne room of God where we we see a broken problem. This, This world is broken, and there's a search for who might be able to fix this problem. Now, I don't know how you come into Easter Sunday uh, today, I don't, I don't know if you've had a great morning so far or not, but I do know this. Every single one of you here in this room has a struggle in their life right now. Right now in your life, you've got some stuff going on. And 
It's because we live in a broken world. Sin has broken this world, and it may not be directly because of anything you did. It might be because of things other people did. It might be for things out of your control. But from the moment that sin stepped into this world, we have a problem, and you feel the effects of that today. And there's a sense of, where can I go to fix my problem? Where can I go so that these things might be made Right, And I want to point you today, and I think this is right for us on Easter Sunday, to put our affections and our focus on the risen Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. The same way he's the solution in Revelation 5, he's the solution for you today because the risen Christ is the one who makes us worthy before God himself. He's the one who fixes all of these problems I want to show you this because I I believe that what you need today is not, not some other person to step in and fix things. In this moment in your life where you feel like things are broken, you need Jesus to fix them. And the way you do that is by just looking to him in worship. So I want you to... Uh, as we walk through, I'm going to give you some things to take notes with. I know that you have a pen today because we put one in your seat. Uh, if you were to grab one of our worship guides in the back of it today, you'll find a place to take notes. I'll give you some things to write down if you'd like to write them down today. Here's the first thing that I want to point to in Revelation 5 for you is that we hope in his plan to make us worthy. We hope in his plan to make us worthy. Worthy. You see, there, there's often times a sense of this world being out of control and the fact that it sometimes feels like there's not really a plan. Like what, what's actually determined for tomorrow? But I, but I want to show you there is a plan for this whole thing, and it comes from one of the major part, focal points of this chapter. If you've got your Bible open or your, your uh, iPhone on there or whatever device you might have, look at verse 1 with me. Then I saw the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. So here's God himself. We're in the throne room with God. And on the throne in his right hand is a scroll written within and on the back and sealed with seven seals. So here's God in all of his power and glory on the throne. And the picture here, if we kind of press into the original language, the picture here of him holding this scroll is not one with a closed hand, but it's with an open hand. He's looking for someone who might be able to come and take this scroll. Now, what's in it? We know a couple things from the text there in verse 5. You see it's written within and on the back. So we know this scroll is detailed. It's front and back. We know that there are quite a few plans and thoughts in it. We also know that it's sealed, that not everybody can get into this scroll. Some have called it the scroll of destiny in which God holds his plans to judge and redeem the world. And here in the book of Revelation, we get a glimpse of only a part of what's in this scroll. Now, let me ask you for a minute. When do you think God wrote the things down in that scroll? How long do you think God has had the plans that have been put into that scroll in his hand? Do do you think that right before, even right now, God's up there kind of scribbling down, thinking what's coming next? Do do you think that, that somehow throughout history and time, maybe somewhere along the way, God's like a football coach at halftime. He comes in and going, man, this thing's not going like we want it to. We need to make a comeback in the second half of creation. And so what I'm going to do is rewrite the end of the plan. I don't think so. I think from the very moment that we rebelled in the garden, God had a plan for all of time. And in this scroll, we see that God has a plan from the past, now, and the future. You think about it. Do you think that when God sent his son to earth that he thought, man, I don't know how this is going to go. And then when people rejected him and put him on a cross and then he was put into a tomb, do you think God sat there in heaven going, I wonder what I'm going to do? Or do you think God knew the entire time that on the third day after his death that he would rise again and become the savior for all of mankind? 
You see, I think that as we look into this resurrection day, as we look to all of history, we can see God knew exactly what he was doing from the very beginning of time. And I want to point you to the scroll because the scroll not only tells the past, but it tells the future. And I'm going to tell you, God knows exactly what he's going to do to the very end. Tomorrow's not a surprise to him. The way the whole world ends is not a surprise to him. And so to press that into your life today, your circumstances are not a surprise to him as well. They might feel like a surprise. You might not know what to do in these moments, but you sit there today and say, how do I know? I know because God has always had a plan and will always have a plan for tomorrow, and he knows what he's doing with my life. But it doesn't always feel that way, does it? It can feel difficult. Notice the text here because there's a question that's posed by an angel. Look at verse 2. I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals. So this is a great angel, possibly Michael, an archangel, that's standing up there posing this question. Who could possibly open the scroll? Look at his answer. And no one in heaven, on earth, or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. There's a sense this is like Thor's hammer that you want to walk up and see who could pick the thing up, right? And no matter which one of us walks up to this scroll, neither me nor you are the best person you've ever met. None of us is worthy to open this scroll because sin has entered into our life, separated us from God. It's created a problem. We can't walk up and open this scroll. There is a question that's posed. Can anybody step in and fix what is broken. So think with me for a moment. The scroll is the unfurling of the ending of time, how God takes creation and he makes things right, how he fixes our broken problems. If nobody can open the scroll, God never fixes our problems. So John feels it. Look what he says here in verse four. He says, I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. So John starts to cry. And we're not talking about the little sniffles or just a little crocodile tear coming out. This is a sobbing. Like Jesus, when he looks over Jerusalem and he cries. This is Peter after he betrays Jesus and he, it breaks him down. This is a, a, a broken sobbing saying, Lord, I, I don't know how this is going to work out if the scroll can't be opened. The hope I have from this broken world being fixed is not going to come about if nobody can open this scroll. Now, let me press that down into your world today. You might feel as if there is no hope of someone that can fix the brokenness in your world. Maybe those are the tears that you cried this morning when you woke up. Maybe this past week or past month, you, maybe there aren't tears, but internally there's this anxiety, depression, struggle inside of you that is building up because you look to this world and you think, how in the world is anybody going to fix the problems that I face? But what I want to point you to today is there is hope in the midst of your tears. And your tears are the tears that a, a lot of other people have cried. You're not crying alone. Think about throughout the Bible, from the Israelites who wandered through the wilderness looking for someone to deliver them, to the Babylon, Babylonian captivity where they were looking to go back to Jerusalem, or the early Christian church martyrs who were looking for a day when God would deliver them. We're a part of a long history of people that have been waiting on God to make this world right. We all yearn for it to be made right. So how will it be? So the scene from develops the problem, but there is a hope in this. Here's the second thing I want you to write down, is we trust in his prophecy to make us worthy. There is a promise of how he's going to do this. So today you need to start trusting in what he said he would do. Remember the scene, we're in the throne room of God. God is on the throne. There's a scroll in his hand. They're looking for someone to open the scroll. The Spirit of God is in the room. Each person of the Trinity is there, but now the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, is about to take center stage. Look with me at verse 5. And one of the elders said to me, 
Weep no more. Stop crying. That, that, that's the hope I want to say to you today. You can stop the despair and the crying because of the hope found in Christ. You see, the risen Christ can take away your tears. He can bring you hope in the midst of pain and struggle. The scene here is of the one who can fix it. He says, don't cry because in the middle of the throne room is someone who can fix it. Look at verse 6. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing. So there's the throne of God, there's these four living creatures, and there's the elders. And in the middle of the throne room is a lamb standing. So I want to talk about the lamb for a moment. What, does, what makes him worthy to open the scroll? And the Bible tells us. Look, look there in the text. He gives us a description. Notice there at the end of verse 6, he says, Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. This lamb is the one that has been prophesied about for all of time. The lion of the tribe of Judah is Judah was described a, as a cub in Genesis 49. And from the descendants of Judah, Jesus would be the lion of the tribe of Judah. And he would be the root of David. We read this, this verse in Isaiah chapter 11 at uh, Christmas. We'll talk about he was the stump of Jesse. Jesse was David's father and Jesus would come from that line. The statement is the one we we know as worthy is the one that has been talked about from the very beginning in God's plan. But notice also what this worthy one do, has done. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, and he has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. You understand conquering is his victory over death and the grave. So the, the reason today Jesus is worthy is because he was dead and now he is alive. He has defeated death in a way that no one ever has before. But the way he did that was through suffering at the cross. Notice verse 6 again. Between the throne, the four living creatures, among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain. Okay, I want you to visualize with me for a moment. A lamb standing, but it looks like it's been killed. So, so this lamb, it's not just they bear, the lamb bears bruises, but by the marks on this lamb, it should be dead. But that's the picture here. It's a lamb slain. So, so it's, a, it's a bit of an ironic scene. Let, let me see if I can help you uh, visualize this. When I was a kid, I was probably six or eight years old, uh, my my uh, uncle Bill, my great uncle Bill, passed away. Now, as far as I know, he's the only preacher in my descendant line, so uh, I do always look back to Uncle Bill. He was a good man, and I remember even him as a kid. But he lived uh, several hours away, and so I remember that, that was kind of the first person I ever knew that had, had died, right? So I, I was learning about death. He, so my, my parents sat down and explained, like, once he died, he passed away, we're we're going to have to, you know, you're not going to see him again, right? And so I'm starting to process what, what death is. And so I remember we went up to the funeral, and uh, my dad and I were at his house. We're sitting on the front porch. And so we're sitting there. It was, a, it was an afternoon. I, I just remember I could still see the scene. And in walks Uncle Bill. And I was thoroughly confused. Six, eight years old. And I look at him. That's, a, that's Uncle Bill. And so you, you imagine here is this older gentleman and my dad standing there talking. I'm a little kid, so I'm kind of intimidated by the scene. And I'm sitting there the whole time. My mind's just running. I'm like, I don't understand this death thing. How's he back? He shouldn't be back. And so the whole time, my mind's going. So I finally get enough courage. I, I go up to my dad. I whisper in his ear. And I was like, Dad, I, I think I thought Uncle Bill had passed away. And then I, I learned that Uncle Bill had a twin brother that was an identical twin, looked just like him. It had terrified me. I thought I had seen a ghost. And, and so in that moment, I, I was pressed to think, 
who I thought looked like he should be dead, was standing in front of me. And in the middle of this throne room, this lamb who was slain, one who should be dead, the Bible says, was standing. Not laying down, not in a grave, but this lamb who was slain for you and I was standing in the midst of the throne room. That, that's the picture here, right? He, he is the one who has conquered death. He has gone to the cross, and he now stands in the midst of this throne room. And then I'll show you the last little descriptor phrase here. Look what it says. He has seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. So the picture is of, of horns. This lamb now has horns like a ram. It's a picture of power, this, the, the picture of Jesus being all powerful. And the, the seven spirits are the picture of the spirit of God. Jesus is all present. He is present everywhere. So, so let me paint the picture. You walk through the Bible study with me for a moment. L- let me paint it again for you. We're looking for one who is worthy. We're looking for one who is able to open the scroll. And the Bible says... Here is one who has been prophesied about from the beginning of time. Here is the one who was slain for your sin, has conquered death, now stands in the midst of the throne room of God, is all-powerful and all-present. This is the sacrificial Lamb of God who emerged victoriously over the grave and is the one who is worthy to take the scroll. That's the picture we have on Easter is when we see a resurrected Lord Jesus, we see one who will stand in the throne room and be able to open the scroll. So what does Jesus do? Look what he says here in verse 7. And he went and he took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. Don't run past the verse here. It's an epic scene. It's greater than any movie scene you've seen with Lord of the Rings or whatever great epic moment you've ever seen. In fact, the Greek presses us to this dramatic moment where the lamb raises up and reaches up and takes this scroll. It's a big deal that finally there is someone who can end the brokenness of this world. That's the hope found here in Revelation 5. It's the hope found in an empty tomb that we have one who has defeated death and now can fix all of the pain and the tears that you have today. That might be where you sit and say, who is it that can fix these tears? It is the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a third thing I want you to see. We worship in his person to make us worthy. We worship in his person to make us worthy. That that the response, what they do in the throne room is to begin to worship God and that's, that's what we are called to do. That's what we're here to do today. I hope and pray that's why you came to church on Easter Sunday. I know you got your pretty pastels on. I dressed up, I pulled my suit out of the closet Right, we're, this is Easter Sunday, we're all going to get together. You're probably here with your family, you're going to go have lunch. You, you uh, maybe had, I talked to somebody earlier, the little girl had three different Easter egg hunts this weekend. She's living it up. <laughs> but why are you at church today? You're at church to worship the Lord Jesus. That's the purpose of this. Look at the text with me, verse 8. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders, what did they do? They fell down before the Lamb. So all 28 beings, created beings that are sitting around this throne, begin to worship the Lamb of God. Each holding, look at the symbolism here, each is holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense which are the prayers of the saints. So they, so they use the, the harp to bring worship to God. There's this singing of worship to him. And then there's these golden bowls. I don't want to run past them. I want you to see this for a moment. That in the throne room of God, 
there are these golden bowls of incense. So they're going up to the Lord, this kind of this uh, smoke going up to the Lord. And in that bowl are the prayers of the saints. If you're a follower of Christ, you're a Christian, you're a saint. Anybody who professes faith in Christ, you go from sinner to saint, okay? Now, if you fall in that category, you need to be careful to not take your prayers too lightly. It's easy for me sometimes to just almost flippantly throw up a prayer and think, does anybody even hear it? You might feel that way right now. When I go and I ask something of God, is it even that important? But we go to the throne room of God and we take the prayer, the prayers of the saints and here they sit in this golden bowl before a holy God. You, you need to think about what you're praying before God. Because you, your holy God is listening to you. Now what are these what do they do in worship? Look at, look at verse 9 with me. And they sang a new song. So here before God, in all of time, they're singing a new song. Now, I, um, I like to play guitar a little bit. I picked it up when I was in high school. If you've ever played guitar or played an instrument, you, you'll learn something about popular music. If you learn four chords, I'm serious, four notes, four chords, you can play almost every song that exists on the radio. I mean, you really can. You could go from one song to another, they might be in a different key or a different order, but, but four chords can cover almost every song you listen to out there. Now, it may sound new to you because they found a different little uh, you know, effect to put on it, but those songs are the same four chords over and over and over again. And you might think after listening to all that music, is it, is it possible at the very end of time when we stand before the throne room of God, is it possible to sing a new song? Absolutely. Because every single day that you wake up and the grace of God puts the breath in you, you have a reason for a new song. You see, the Bible says his mercies, every single day you wake up, are new every morning. And so why, if his mercies are new every morning, are, are you not ready and willing to sing a new song to him every day? So here, around the throne, a new song comes out to bring worship to Jesus Christ, who is truly worthy of our worship. Now notice who's, who's there around the throne. Worthy are you to take the scroll and open its seals, for you were slain by your blood. You ran some people from God, for God. And notice who these people are. They're from every tribe and language and people and nation. All the strife we have between nations, between races, and between peoples, gone right here. We're all around the throne of God together. You have made made them a kingdom. We're united together in the kingdom of God and priests to our God. That's what we'll be. And they shall reign on the earth. You see, the purpose of this entire act, what has happened here from the Lamb of God when he takes the scroll, everybody responds in worship. That's the entire scene. It's to stand and say, Jesus Christ is worthy to take the scroll. You see, that, that, that's what happens in this throne room, and I'll press it into your world today, the tears you cried last week, the answer to those tears is to point your focus and attention and your eyes to Jesus. That's what fixed John's tears. When he saw the Lamb of God, that's what changed his pain, because he knew someone was there to fix what is broken. So what do you need today on this Easter Sunday to fix what is broken? You know, I, I, uh, I enjoy singing, but I'm not very good. I mentioned earlier I like to play guitar. The best part about a guitar is I can tune the guitar. I cannot tune my voice. It is just bad. And uh, some of you can relate in the room. Anybody else in here a bad singer with you? You know, you're with me. And um, I, I'm just not very good. But one of the things I've learned about music 
is music has a way about igniting the, the soul. When you sing something, it brings life to it for you. And, and I know, I, I've been in church long enough and seen enough people to know a lot of times we don't sing. We look up front, we think, folks up front, they sing pretty good, and I'm just going to let them keep doing it, right? But what I'd like for us to do today is maybe to end a little bit different. I, I'm going to ask you, if you would, I'm going to ask you all to sing as we close our time together. I think it's the proper response to Revelation 5 and the risen Christ. That if we truly have come in contact and put our affections on the one who is worthy, then our hearts and our desires ought to be able to, ought to want to sing and bring praise and call him worthy. Just a few years ago, a guy named Andrew Peterson wrote a song called, Is He Worthy? He took Revelation 5 and he put it into song for us. It's a, it's a beautiful song. And it gives us an opportunity as a group and a people to declare that together, to say that. And I, I want to say this to you today. What your soul needs more than anything else is to see and sing about the worthiness of Christ. It, it's what you need today. And, and, and maybe you're here today and you, you, you know that you're not a believer and you know as we've talked, you're like, I, I'm back in church for the first time in a long time. I need to... I need to turn my life over to God. I, I know I'm not in the right place. What we're going to do in a moment, we're going to sing. There'll be pastors down front like you may be used to in church that are here, and they'd love to pray with you and receive you if that's what the Lord's doing in your heart and your life. I, I, that's an open invitation to anybody who wants to say, I need to know that, Lord Jesus. But what I want us all to do today is respond with singing. So I'm going to ask the worship team to come back out. We're going to do this a little bit different today. I'm, I'm not going to pray to, to move us to this next section because what I want you to do is as you have heard the scene of Revelation 5, I want us all to sing about it. And maybe in these moments, the Lord will give us a glimpse of what it's going to be like before his throne room as we declare he is truly worthy. Now, one of the things I want to do is to read a few verses. So what I'd like to ask you to do now before I do that, would you please go ahead and stand? What I'm going to do is read from Revelation 5, the rest of the chapter. As I read it, maybe what, I want, maybe what you need to do is close your eyes, and I want you to imagine what the scene would be like. And then let us take a moment to declare he is worthy through song. So I'm going to begin reading Revelation 5. We'll start in verse 11. I'm going to work my way down through the chapter. As I do that, I, I want you to visualize this, and I, I want you to imagine what this moment would be like. Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders and the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped.
Do you feel the world is broken? We do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. But do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? We do. Do you wish that you could see it all made? all creation groaning it is is a new creation coming it is is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst it is is it good that we remind ourselves what our heart needs is to bring praise and honor and glory to the Lord Jesus. Maybe the Lord continued to speak with you in that moment. Maybe that was the first time you've worshiped the Lord like that. You say, I, I need today to be saved. I realize in these moments I'm not a Christian. Let me say, there's no better day to come to faith in Jesus than on Easter Sunday. 
So maybe today's your day of salvation. You, we'd love to pray with you and to talk to you about that. There, these pastors that were down front, they're still going to be here after the service. There's an area, if you go out to the left in the lobby called Next Steps, you just walk up, you say the word Jesus, and we'd be happy to talk to you about your relationship with the Lord. I'll even press it further. Maybe you haven't been in church in a while. COVID's kind of got us disconnected, and you, your relationship with the Lord's not where it should be, and you know it today. You felt it in that moment. You missed this. But what you need is the church. You felt it right there, and this isn't, you aren't meant to grow by yourself. You're meant to grow as a body, and what you felt today is not church on the couch. I know we had that for a little bit with COVID. This is what we were meant to be in. And so today, you need to figure out what is your step to be a part of Richland Creek. Maybe it's joining our church. We have a new members class coming up just a couple weeks from today called Discover Richland Creek. We, we have our life groups. If you, you want to know how to take that step, that's what that next steps area is. Today's your day to say, how can I step forward in my faith today? Let me pray for us and then we'll be dismissed today. Heavenly Father, we declare you are the one who is worthy of our praise. We love you. We thank you for this moment, this little glimpse of heaven to be able to declare you are worthy. And Lord, may we walk out of here as new people with the joy of the Lord to bring you praise and honor and glory in our lives. And we pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. God bless you all.